Hey, I drove up uh I drove up this weekend to Gloria's house to get uh the first run of uh Steve's collection that we're donating to the foundation. So Steve Parrish's stuff? Yeah. That's cool. Woo, there's a box of gold. Holy shit. How is that? Got um he's got two pristine 1902 manuals. One of them was written in there. Um this is the property of it looks like Ferguson cuz I see a bunch of uh his collection that was from Ferguson. Do you does that ring name ring a bell at all, George? There was a Ferguson no. that was in a bunch of Parrish's books. And it says um the property of property of Ferguson uh purchased from the Secretary of the Interior on May 20th, 1903, and it was handwritten in the front cover of the book. Yeah, I wasn't around in 1903. <laughs> I just didn't know if there was a Ferguson name that associated with no, it. Right, that doesn't that... ring a bell with me, but but I'll tell you, Steve was Steve oh, yeah. was magnet for all things old and valuable, that's for sure. Yeah. You know, what I was totally shocked about was, um, I mean, unless he started donating them long before, but uh, no, no old equipment. Gloria didn't have like any old like mountain transits. I thought maybe he'd have a huge collection of like mountain transits or something, but it was more books than anything. Yeah, he was he was into books and and yeah. and maps and things like that more than anything else. Yep, I do have yeah. a I do have and a few maps and history. Yeah, yeah, oh yeah, I know. There was a bunch. Um, yeah, there's some. There's definitely some gold in there. I got a. I picked up. We put the back seats down in the expedition, and it filled up the entire back back of the expedition. So, and she's got way more to go, but that was the that was kind of the first run. So, better get a big box van. I know. I, for the next trip. I know. Fly up and rent something to drive back. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, it was uh, 17 hours of driving, 1,300 miles to run, he, uh, to Steve run up had there. donated his, uh, his entire collection of the Flansburg prints mm -hmm. um, uh, to the Montana Association oh, yes. last year. Yep. And uh, we had a big auction up there. Yep, I was lucky enough to snag one print from him, got him to sign it for me and on the back and oh, uh, cool. treasure that one. Yeah, I know. I know uh, yeah, Matt, those, Morris, Matt Morris brought all those, right? Yeah, those Flansburg prints were pretty awesome. It yep. was the, the front cover of the Montana um, magazine for decades. Yep. And uh, each one of them has a, a hidden gem in there for some something to do with surveying. Yep. Um, they're really, really cool prints. Ended up with a buffalo print myself. Oh, very cool. Uh, one of the books I went... I, look through this morning really quick that you would like uh john was uh the manual of instructions for mineral surveyors district of utah original oh yeah print. yeah i'd like to get a good copy of that original, I've got a digital copy original print 1890 Ooh. yeah nice yeah it's beautiful you gonna <laughs> i was, put those I was in geeking the, out i was geeking out uh, earlier are those going to be in the auction uh, or in uh, yeah. vegas yeah, and so we'll probably split it up for over a couple of years, and that's what I was talking with uh, Chrissy today too. Is uh, there's so much stuff like we have the big conference, obviously this 2024, and then we go up to Reno with just CLSA in Nevada, and then 2026, obviously you guys Utah and another big Western one. So we'll probably split up a lot of the stuff over the next couple of conferences because there's some there's some good stuff in there. So. Well, I'll be in Vegas, so uh, make sure oh. it's on the on the table there. Okay, you want you coming this year too? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, and then uh, twenty four, uh, twenty six Utah is joining us. So. Right. Yep. Okay. Friends, Zach, y'all go for it. Uh, yeah, Jesse, I'll be there. Uh, I just booked my flight last night. Actually, um, I, I fly in on the seventeenth, and then present on the eighteenth, and I fly out at like five o'clock on Friday the nineteenth. So I'll be there, Jesse. Yeah, I'd love to see some of them books here. Uh, I know there is. Um, I was actually going to text uh, Pat. There's there was a, like a three ring binder in there of a manual manual of instructions for organ plants and trees and bushes or something like that. I was laughing. <laughs> I think <laughs> forestry kids, right? I know there was some good stuff in there. So for those uh, jumping on, we're talking about the I got. 
a huge collection of Steve Parrish's stuff. He passed away on October 2nd and uh, his wife was looking to clean out the house a little bit and start getting rid of some of his collection. So he was a uh, started surveying in 1965. Um, I have his personal uh, 1947 BLM manual that he put all his notes in because uh, he started surveying in 65. So 47 was his manual. Um, he was a forest service, BL, uh, forest service surveyor, BLM surveyor, um, uh, old Nevada state cadastral ba uh, BLM surveyor. So he's just got this collection of stuff. It's amazing. So, well, you know, the dendrology stuff, Trent, uh, you probably don't remember. It probably wasn't on your test, but it was sure on my test that I took to become licensed. They wanted to know what dendrology was. If, if you didn't know that you, you lost some points for that question. Mm, yeah, nope. That was not on mine. <laughs> mm. Mm -hmm. um interesting yeah i can't wait i can't wait to go through the rest of the boxes but all right zach it's uh 411 sorry you got rambling on about good 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 old good stuff. stuff good stuff man good stuff. <laughs> i love it uh real quick all right i'll read uh, zach's bio and then we can get started uh zachary Rodell has worked in the geospatial community for more than 21 years specializing in aerial pho photogrammetry acquisition flight management metric uh camera management and project management. He has a passion for all things aerial mapping related. related. The most Camaro. Hold on. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, it's going to be a long presentation. <laughs> I haven't even started. Jeez, <laughs> Louise, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> good thing for editing. Uh, he has a member. He is a member of Cooper Aerial's team since February of 2010. During his time, Zach has managed over a thousand aerial mapping projects, ranging from local, state, and federal levels. With his understanding of GIS, aerial mapping, UAV, and the familiarity of data management, he is an integral member of the project team. In addition to this, Zachary currently holds the company's position as Southwest Business Development Manager and holds a certificate of cert certified mapping scientist of UAV from ASPRS. Woo! I got through it. Oh, <laughs> See? That, that's all you have to follow, Zach. See, look at all those mess ups. It's amazing. It's amazing. <laughs> all right, we've got a, all right, here we go. <laughs> got a lot of slides to cover. Thank you, Trent. Uh, all right. Trent thanks for thanks for all you do. Everybody yeah. that's here, uh, uh, thirty-five souls that are here. Thank you for being here, and yeah, the many, and the many more that we'll hopefully see it in the future on YouTube. So, uh, <laughs> mentoring Mondays hosted by Trent Keenan. I'm Zach Riddell, and we'll be talking about all things aerial mapping. We're going to go a little bit. Uh, so, Cooper Aerial, real quick. Uh, Cooper Aerial, we have offices in Arizona, Pennsylvania, California, and Mexico. Uh, we started in 1966, so we just started, we just celebrated our 57th year in business. Um, we provide services nationwide, but we mostly, mainly focus in the Southwest and the Northeast, Pennsylvania, New York, and New Jersey, and uh, uh, Maryland, and Virginia. But we, we service the entire uh, United States and internationally. This is our forward-facing team. Um, Cooper Air was uh, first owned by Bill Cooper. It was starting in 1966. His son took over in 1987. Jeff Cooper. Uh, he rest his rest in so, rest in peace, Jeff. And now the current owner is Phil Gershkovich. So Phil's been the owner since March 2016. Pete Priestner is the vice president of business development. And a thing on Phil. Phil's the CEO. He has a master in GIS. He is a, uh, a certified photogrammetrist, and he's also got a, um, a master's in business that we just got in ASU. The guy's a go-getter. He really um, he commands a uh, he commands a lot of information, and he's running the company very smoothly in the last several years. Uh, Greg Frank, he's head of marketing. Lawrence Doidge. Uh, Dennis Harmons is our survey manager who's doing a lot of, in, you know, interesting work uh, in the surveying uh, field currently in, in Arizona. Jim Kroom, who we'll talk about a little bit later, he's our UAV manager. He's been a surveyor for over 45 years. 
Kim, unfortunately, no work, longer works with us. Max is a uh, uh, an amazing IT specialist, and he's a problem solver. Emily is the senior uh, project manager and oversees all the PMs. And then you got me. Uh, and Trent gave me a really nice intro, so thank you, Trent. Me and Camaro. Our services are uh, aerial mapping. We do aerial mapping, aerial LIDAR. UAVs, uh, GIS, orthophotography, conventional surveying, large scale, uh, large scale and plotting, and large scale printing and plotting and scanning. We also, you guys know a lot about land surveying. Everybody that's on the call, we do top to bottom land surveying, and we're experts in A dot right away Arizona Department of Transportation and MicroStation, AutoCAD, Civil 3D deliverables, and we do a lot of field work, and we've been doing a lot of construction work. Phil's purchased a few companies, so we've, we've gotten uh, a, few P, uh, a few RLSs in those, uh, in those purchases, and that's been really helpful in the Arizona and specifically in the Phoenix office. So these are the industries that Cooper Aerial serves, uh, land development, uh, airport maintenance, facilities, municipal and government, uh, energy, transportation, and waste management. So what we're going to do here, we're going to go, we're going to, we're going to go way back right now. So we're going to go take a little time machine for, uh, and see what, what was happening a long time ago. Second. Okay. So no one is credited specifically with the invention or discovery of photography. It was developed over the last six centuries, so the last 600 years. And the Greek word photography means to draw with light. And the 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 image that you're seeing right there, that is that is basically the camera or obscura. So projecting light inside, it would flip upside down and then project itself in a completely dark room with the image and colors on the back. And Aristotle came up with this concept uh, about 2,400 years ago. <laughs> Leonardo da Vinci, uh, he worked on, when images of illuminated objects enter a very dark room through a very small hole and fall on a piece of paper at some distance of the hole, one will see the paper of all objects and their forms and colors. So. Da Vinci was working on this about 600 years ago. He knew what it was about. He knew how to do it. And he knew how to, uh, in his drawings, he knew how to take that concept of, of projection and do it with his drawings. The first time the word camera was ever used was in 1568 by Daniello Barbaro. And you can see that was one of his drawings and you can see the perspective. I mean, that is the introduction of, you know, how we get lines and tangents and how to make things look uh, 2D on, you know, make look 3D on a 2D surface. Thomas Wedgwood, 1771 to 1805. So now we're in the, you know, a little bit more curtain. He's the first person known to have thought of creating permanent pictures by creating camera images on material coated with a light sensitive chemical. Then on the right, Sir Humphrey Davy, he was a British chemist in and around that time. And the two, these two experimented with silver chloride and silver nitrate and succeeding in creating the first photographic images by means of a camera. But they, they didn't stay like, uh, they got them, they held them on the piece of paper, but eventually the image was fade, would fade away. So that was a problem. So they, they had to figure this out. So this gentleman right here, over a period of three years, Nisa for Nice, he's credited with the first permanent light sensitive photograph during that period. So the permanent, like it stayed forever. So he was the guy. So uh, not until 1825 did we have permanent photography. Then Wheatstone, in about 1832, Wheatstone was the first person who experimented in stereo stereoscopy and geometrical designs. And he figured out how to use mirrors and the two plates, as you can see on the side of his head there, the E, you know, the blue and the, the yellow, that's, you would look through the little uh, lens viewer and use the two, um, use the pieces of glass, the mirror, and actually be able to see in 3D for the first time. And that's the first stereoscopic viewer using the eyepiece and photos and mirrors. William Talbot, he invented the 
calotype process, and he also invented the first permanent negative exposed from a camera. So not the first picture, the first negative. So he was the guy in 1835 that came up. He looks a little cratchety. He looks kind of annoyed, I think, in that photo, but he probably had to stay really still for about 20 to 30 minutes for that photo to take. So in 1852, so now we're getting a bit more current, under the engineers' corps of the French army, Lestat, Lazadat, excuse me, developed the camera surveying process, and people call him the uh, father of photogrammetry. So in about 1850, we, we established this process of photogrammetry, or the intro of it, and the Germany, Germany utilized, realized the possible military value of photography and assisted in military operations of the Franco-Prussian War, so in 1870. Then the, then the guy who took the first aerial was um, Nadir, or Gaspard Felix Cornichon, and he was known as Nadir, and he was a French photographer, caricaturist, and journalist, and a balloonist, and he was the first guy that went up in a balloon, in a hot air balloon, and in 1858, he was the first one to be the, to take the images in a free balloon. Photogrammetry, the science of using aerial photographs and other remote sensing imagery, 3D data to obtain measurements of natural and human made features of the earth and produce planimetric and topographic maps. Now everybody that's a surveyor, these are the these are the photogrammetry periods, and they go in about 50-year increments. And the first one was plane table and is an extension of the conventional, conventional plane table surveying. Each exposure station was determined by a resection plotted on the plane table, and the exposed photos were oriented on the plane table in the directions. So the different objects were transferred onto map sheets. As you can see, that's you know, it's a uh, you have the tool up on the on the tripod and they drew the maps that specific way in plane table so that lasted for about 50 years uh, in this little section we're going to highlight a few people that were really really important into modern aerial photogrammetry and uh, and just photography aerial photography carl zeiss he lived from 1816 to 1888 and he was in, he had an optics workshop in in jena and Jena, there, Jena and Graz are still the two capitals where all the best glass and all the great optics from Zeiss and Leica and uh, all the and um, Schneider Kruch. So in 1847, he was making microscopes full time. In 1861, the Zeiss workshop was considered to be a, the best scientific instrument makers in Germany. The thing that made Zeiss really, really special was he was a machinist and a craftsman so he made the tools better and more functional for people to use them as, as opposed to just you know very kind of simple instruments he really used them so they were easy to use and they were more comfortable to use for long durations in the lab now we get to george eastman this guy was really important because he was the founder of kodak and he was an entrepreneur and he helped bring the photographic pro use of roll film into the mainstream. Now, the thing that made him special was he created the camera. It would have a hundred photographs on inside the chamber ready to go. So you would buy the camera with a hundred, you would take all hundred shots, you would send the entire thing back to him. And then he would expose, he would take out the film, expose it, process it, send you back the negatives, and then send you back your camera with the uh, with the new hundred shots. So he was really the first person that um, so the company would process the film, make a print, load another roll, and send the camera back. So he he really got cameras into people's hands that were not widely available before. And he developed the first color film in 1935. And with Edison, he basically started the motion picture industry uh, in the 30s. Now, this guy, Scheinflug, so this is how we get two stereo images to take pictures of terrain and actually put them in stereo so that you can actually see them in 3D. So the Scheinflug rule 
was actually discovered by a Frenchman by the name Jules Carpentier. And that was called the hinge room, but it was it was associated with Schein Flug. In 1898, Schein Flug invented a double pro projection device, the principle of which is still the form form forms the basic and a lot of analytical stereo projection plotting equipment. And what he did was he set up two cameras in a in a simulation over a terrain model, exposed them and then reestablish the original orientation of the photographs, thereby understanding um, the roll pitch and yaw essentially of the camera, the lens and the height above the terrain, and then was able to set up the first map of a 3D terrain model produced in 3D. Now we're getting to 1900 to 1960, which is analog photogrammetry. This uh, employs analog device analog, analog device technology that represents numerical quantities. In 1895, Deville he created the first instrument for stereo observation of overlapping photographs. So as you see on the right, that's a newer one from probably you know the 50s, but this is the type of equipment that an operator, as you can see in the uh, in the eyepiece. You would set the uh, stereo negatives up. Usually this would probably be glass plate at that time. And then you would scribe from there. In 1903, the Wright brothers took the first airplane flight. In 1908, uh, we created, uh, Von Oral created the first stereo autograph, which was the st first stereo plotting machine, which combines Pul Pulfrick's uh, stereo compartmenter. And in 20, Nistri and Zeiss created the first optical analog stereo plotter. Obviously, World War I and World War II, huge, huge with the cameras. As you can see, those are the cameras that would go in the spy planes, and they would be probably switched out, you know, every flight. You would take them out. They would produce the negatives, uh, process the negatives, and get what was, you know, get the information as quick, quickly as they could. And in the early stages of World War I, the Germans were installing cameras on Zeppelins and airplanes and the allied forces, they knew they knew the benefit of what this was. And basically 80% in World War II, 80% of all the intelligence obtained uh, of all the land measurements and what was happening, you had targets, trip wires, uh, trip wires on beaches, enemy aircraft, shipping, mined areas, large electronics, any bomb damages or where uh, troops were moving at this time. This is how they collected this information from high altitude, and then they would get it back and then they would make their new thoughts on what they were gonna do. Okay. Another really important person in aerial photography was uh, Victor Hasselblad. Hasselblad wanted to document birds and then in, in World War II, uh, he was from Sweden, but and they ma maintained neutrality, obviously. A Luftwaffe plane was shot down, and the Army said, hey, we need to get into this business. And uh, Victor Hasselblad said, I'll do you one better. I'll create the best camera that you've ever seen, and this will be the new state-of-the-art camera. And this was the camera right here. So in 1941, the Hasselblad Ross HK7 this was as state of the art as it gets. It had the best glass. It had a four by five um, piece of film. So you had really great negative and it was handheld. So it wasn't huge and bulky and crazy. So now right here, you can see a, a, a pretty big change in huge stereo equipment getting a lot. It's getting smaller now. So now things are micronizing a little bit and you could, uh, mount this camera or you could shoot use it to uh out of the plane window whatever you really wanted to do and get great shots with it Hasselblad also was the camera that was used um on the moon landings and in 1972 lidar with radar at first but lidar came from radar uh, of scanning the the moon surfaces and then just a year later in 1973 uh, GPS started, global positioning system started and invented in 1973. Now this guy, 
really important because this is where it goes from private and war efforts into the public sphere. So Hasselblad created smaller cameras. And then this gentleman, Sherman Mills Fairchild, I'm sure a lot of people have heard of Fairchild, but he came from a very wealthy family. He founded over 70 companies, including Fairchild Aircraft, Fairchild Industries, and Fairchild Camera and Instruments. So his father was extremely wealthy. I think he was an only child. He was a real playboy type, you know, in the in the, basically in the heyday of the 20s, 30s, and 40s. He really, really was out there. And he was determined, um, what do we got here? Huge contributions to the aviation industry. And one of the main things is he figured out how to do forward motion compensation and synchronized camera shutter and flash so that you could get way better picture and sharper. And at the beginning, they told him, we don't, we're not really interested in what you have, but he just kept trying harder and harder and harder until finally they took some orders from him. And then that the, the US government, and basically after that, he was accepted and I over 90% of all the aerial cameras used by the allied forces were fair child design. So he had the aircraft and he had all the, um, all the camera equipment as well. Fairchild aerial surveys uh, expanded into Canada. And then in, I believe in 1924 Fairchild, uh, well, it was, uh, in 1924 Fairchild photographed the largest the first large city which was New Newark New Jersey and that was the first actual massive uh, back and forth you know um, a big pattern of stereo mapping that was ever created which was in 1924 and he also did in the in the 70s, he created the first lunar camera that actually wasn't attached, like small that you could handhold, but that was the one that was on the uh um on the actual aircraft itself. And it took 7,000 individual frames. And they brought that back and got a lot of data of the moon and surface. Okay. I think a lot of people know about this guy. He was he's pretty famous for a lot of the uh, surveying equipment, Henrik Wilde. He was a surveyor by trade, and he produced the atolites that became popular with survey for surveyors in the you know the twenties. On you know his wild T two T three instruments uh, were used for many many uh, years, and then it went on to the and it was went on and being been sold to the Kern Company, and then eventually Wild Leica de developed the the RC thir RC one three five. 10, 20, and 30 aerial metric cameras. And then these are these are it. Oh, excuse me. We're going to skip ahead. Right there is the RC30. And that was the, uh, the most robust and highest end aerial mapping film camera that was used ever. And we're going to come back real quick. Now we're entering into the second to last. So this is the third period of photogrammetry, analytical photogrammetry which is uh, solutions obtained by mathematical meth methods. So 1941, the Zeus, Zeus company invented the electric computer. You can actually see it right behind there, that large uh, copper thing. That is the actual first electronic compu computer. And in 57, Heleva invented the analytical plotter, which is to the right. Currently, the theodolite during this time was kind of stepping aside and we started getting electronic stuff like the geodometer and the tellurometer. And in 59, the Hewlett Packard made the first really light and conventional unit for survey community. So 1960 is really when electronics and uh, large powered machines came into surveying, kind of replacing theodolites and chain at this point. And um, 1980 through 90, K&E, Lights, Topcon, Leica, Kern, they continued to create smaller and smaller units with stronger diodes to be mounted on top of the atolites. Analytical plotter. So things they in that top right corner and in the bottom right corner, this stuff is huge. I mean, this is some big equipment. 
and then it was used to scribe the map as you can see on you know in the bottom left there the scriber would take the information that was used in the plotter and then it would it would start digitizing and scribe it on the actual map and then the in the picture in the top left corner that's a that's a much smaller and that's they were still using that machine maybe 10 15 years ago so the analytical plotters the a5 a6 a8 bc1 bc2 bc3 this is really interesting stuff for anybody who knows about this equipment it lasted for a really really long time and then we enter the the di digital photogrammetry age which is 1990 to present so right now we have stereo viewing on computer screen um soft copy photogrammetry software digital large format cameras are uh, ubiquitous at this time i think the first digital camera was the leica L A als 40 which preceded the rc30 um, we now have extremely good gps and land survey equipment lidar is really making an impact now uh, the first lidar unit was in 1995 and it would actually produce one point per square kilometer not you know many points per square meter so it was one dot per square kilometer and networking and compute personal computing power have become exceptional and as we all know the rise of the uav uh, gps data collectors all this stuff is really kind of really coming into its own at this point and getting better to what what we have currently in in 2023 RC30, the Zeiss RMT, RMK Top 15, these were the top, top uh, film cameras, which have been replaced by digital cameras. And then this is me. This is when I first came to, uh, this is to kind of like wrap me into where I fit at, through all that stuff. And then here I am. This is me in the airplane. I was in the airplane for uh, over about 10 years. Um, I've seen 48 of the United 48 states of the United States. I've flown around the world three times, about a hundred thousand miles. And I worked at three of the larger uh, mapping companies in the United or four of them: Air Photographics, Keystone Aerial, uh, Gam Air, and Cooper Aerial. And then um, what were we gonna say? In 2011. Jeff Cooper and I and Jeremy Brockman helped to start the UAV program at in Cooper Aerial, and uh, I've done a lot of public speak, speaking about what's you know the stuff that's happening and where we are currently. Hold on, you can't skip over the survived a plane crash. I did survive a plane crash in <laughs> two, like... 2011, <laughs> and and right after that we started the UAV program, obviously for <laughs> <laughs> out of necessity. Uh, that that plane crash was in uh, Truth or Consequences, New Mexico. And let me tell you all, there was a lot of truth and there was a lot of consequences. <laughs> Absolutely. And um, and move forward. These two surveyors, when I came to Cooper Aerial, Earl Watts, uh, rest in peace. Earl passed away in 2018, unfortunately. And Rick Bunger was the head of surveying at Cooper Aerial for a long time. He grew up in the globe area and Earl was his like second in command and these two guys really got me understanding what precision was what accuracy was airborne GPS uh, GPS going out in the field and really understanding the difference between looking at Google Earth and being in the field and understanding 50 acres is a lot bigger when you're standing on in a lot than it is looking at the, you know, the computer screen. A lot of, you know, people don't know that, but that's really important in an understanding that you have to have. So here's a five photographs that I actually took and we'll move forward. So this is Telluride, Sedona up in Montana somewhere, Mount Baker in Oregon, and then the Pat Tillman Callahan Bridge. <laughs> so now we're gonna move to, we're gonna talk some more about aerial mapping. What are the pros and cons of helicopters, planes, and UAVs? So this is just, uh, this is probably, you know, one of the top, 
helicopters that you could possibly have very expensive high capacity long range super fast as you can see it's got the really amazing gimbal on the on the right side of the helicopter that's a that's a multi hundred thousand dollar gimbal uh photo photographed pod and then it's also photography pod and then it's also got uh, a really killer high-end rigel uh, lidar sensor so this thing can really do everything that you could want it to it's probably got multiple cameras in that pod so you'd have a still frame a video and maybe a thermal and then the lidar so this thing would be absolutely fantastic for transmission line work and then here's a little different of a this is a little smaller of a unit probably can travel a little less a little less expensive and then uh you would call a small or medium format um sensor which is that's another rigel sensor but that's called the the vux one or i think it's the vux three now really killer novatel and then an imu on the front but a, a a medium format sensor i would call so the pros of helicopter extreme extreme quality of the aerial imagery video or lidar very high precision can stay on course can mobilize quickly uh helicopters can fly at 500 and above and just fly just a bit above above uh, uavs at that point you have door operation so you could take photos out the window you could navigate easier and the most common helicopter for aerial pho photography is the robinson r44 because it's small and it's cheap to operate and you can fly a pretty good distance so the cons would be smaller fuel ca capacity you can't fly as far definitely weather dependent high winds it's not great equipment is pretty costly and flying a helicopter plane flying a plane is hard but flying a helicopter is harder there's no doubt about it so here's a bunch of the planes that I know of that are these are these are the planes that are the top in the industry right now so you got the the 206 or the 210 turbo 182 the probably the best and the brightest is the turbine prop 441 um it's luxurious it's big it can go really fast and it's uh jet power uh, jet engines the 310 is the most common and the 402 is another one that's fantastic the technam is a newer uh plane it's really small but it can fly pretty good distances and it's got low overhead piper aztec another plane that's like that uh the era commander is what we operate out of uh tucson fantastic plane super long range and the piper navajo also a very long range very spacious inside um and can go great distances and carry a lot of equipment so what are the pros of airplanes obviously again quality aerial video and lidar excuse me video not so much but lidar and aerial high weight capacity you can throw a lot of stuff in it if it's a larger plane you normally planes fly from a thousand feet or above and um there is a lot of airplanes available but not all of them have holes and uh you know reasonable pricing currently but the airplane industry it's gotten a lot more expensive probably in the last five years things have gotten more they've gotten a lot more costly um because the numbers the ages are going higher and the numbers are going less uh this these platforms can cover i'd say 700 but i'd say five to eight hundred and they have comfort now the cons of it single uh, single prop system you can't fly as far dual prop better but you're using more fuel equipment costs and there's a pilot shortage for planes so we have to take that into consideration currently and into the future and it also again takes knowledge and skill to operate and you have to be very cautious just like you would be with uh, helicopters now we're into the uavs DJI just released its recent product, the M350. It's fantastic. And the L2 new payload. So what we're seeing with the L2 payload versus the L1 is five returns of LiDAR instead of three, which creates more understanding in, you know, ground, a little higher, top of tree. So you can get a better understanding and more math into the solution to get less fuzziness and higher clarity. And I believe the sensor is producing 
500 rep 500,000 repetitions per second instead of 250,000 points per second which is fantastic and the price point actually went down it's cheaper than the L1 so it's crazy the Alta Freefly system that's a fantastic rig for lidar and photography and specifically that's the camera system that's used in a lot of uh, film work like uh, film and video work the vapor, the vapor was the hot thing, but it kind of faded out because of too many crashes and it was very, very expensive. And unfortunately, the expense and the payloads that it could carry were great, but they had a lot of problems. So that one kind of faded out into the distance. And the Wingtra is the Wingtra V2. I, I'm, we're really happy with that one. We have the M350 and, or the M300 and the Wingtra V2. The M300 that we currently have usually flies at 200 foot and the M and the Wingtra flies at 400 foot for the sweet spot of the camera and sensor payload. This is the UAS blue list. These are all everything that's not DJI. Everything that DJI has is not on this list. You cannot uh, fly any government or federal projects with DJI. All of these drones are all on the blue list. So if you have federal projects, they have to be one of these. And this, this might be a slightly, a little outdated list, but this is a basic understanding of what is available and what, what you can fly on the blue list. It's It's gotta be American made and ha meet specific criteria that they've laid out in that uh, blue UAS cleared list. So the pros of UAV, Obviously, high resolution, small and medium format with the phase one cameras, um, great imagery, great video, great LIDAR, great thermal. I mean, you can put a lot of payloads on the UAV that smaller versions of them, but you're closer so that your resolution is very high. Um, high precision, AB GPS and IMU quality because of the size, it's a little lacking. It, it's going to get better, but I, I feel like right now we're still in, it's good, but it, it's not great. And I know within the next five years, it's going to be fantastic. You got easy to control and deploy. Um, VTOL or rotocopter can hover in place, which is great. Um, the flying platforms or the plane ones, they can go at faster speeds and cover a lot more ground. And the other thing that are great about UAVs is reaching hazardous areas where people can't go. Like this is really important for the safety of crews or to locate something or visual inspection. Th these are huge things that we couldn't really do quickly, but now we can, you know, quick set up, fire it up, get the information that we need, take it back to the office, research it and create better decision uh, making. And the UAV is becoming ubiquitous. The cons of the UAV are the 400 foot ceiling. I feel like in the future, we're, we're going to get past this 55 pound total weight. I think that's pretty good. But if you want to fly farther distances with electric, you're going to have the crafts are going to have to get bigger. A UAV that I saw yesterday on YouTube was a UAV that could pick up an entire deer go get your deer that you that you just harvested and then bring it back to the truck and drop it off to you which is insane so this uav was it was monstrous it was like the size of a truck bed and it could carry a 300 a 200 pound deer which was wild um that thing people were people are constantly innovating with the uav thing I guess the other thing that I would have to say from, you know, being a photogrammetry company, instant mapping professionals, we have to be conscious of, of who is processing the data, what is their level of knowledge, what are they doing with it, what are the products they're creating, uh, are they making mapping products, do they have a firm card holder like an RLS on site, and really what it really comes down to to me is, yeah, you can make maps all day, but can you fix the problems when they happen? When you work with the Cooper area or any photogrammetry company that's been around for a while, we've seen all the problems, we've fixed them all. And that's that's really where the salt is in understanding having a three or 400 year, uh, you know, Cooper area has like three to 400 years of uh, 
professional time added up with all the employees and all their knowledge, as opposed to the environmental guy who's producing a map. And there's no like, it, it, there's no like badness on that. We want the environmental guy or lady to know how to do this and be able to create great work. But if they're just producing maps without the knowledge and understanding, it's going to cause a problem. And there could be lawsuits, there could be bad data, there could be revenue lost. And what what it comes down to is, can you fix the problem if something does go wrong? Insurance costs are high for all of these. Weather dependent, the drone is pretty good about that because you're not flying up in the clouds so much. That's really good. Privacy is an issue, spying's an issue, software issues and malfunctions, and what else do I have here? Noise and environmental waste from new battery tech and upgradable gadgets. So if you wanted, the thing that you're seeing right now is we've got like 40 minutes on X battery payload right now. If you wanted to go 80 or 200 minutes, you're going to have to make a gigantic battery or a very, uh, a really robust battery that's super small, but then the price point's gonna go really, really high. So if you wanna fly two to four hours, you're going to, uh, you're gonna have to go gas powered, which I kind of feel like is going the wrong direction, but that's currently the state of UAVs or hydrogen. And recently, I think at the last show, I asked, they had, there was a hydrogen guy, he had a, he had a whole thing. I said, well, how much is the drone? He was like, it's 50 grand. I go, okay, how do you get the hydrogen? You know, he goes, well, you ship us the container back and then we ship it back to you. I go, well, that doesn't seem very productive. He goes, well, we, we do have a maker of hydrogen. Like you can make the hydrogen at your place. It looked like a, a refrigerator and then you plug it in the can that device was $120,000. So that is not really the way we want to go either, I guess. So they're still working on that technology as we speak. So what I see a lot as a project senior project manager or business development, everybody wants to fly a drone on every single project. And I'm here to tell you that's it's not the greatest solution and you shouldn't be fooled by that. And you should really pay attention to the the right jobs used for the right tools eventually drones will be able to do the things that manned aircraft i mean it, it's gonna happen but they'll get bigger and um, we'll see what happens in the next five to ten years but currently planes are king for in our opinion everything over 250 but we fly projects from five to 30 five acres to thirty thousand acres and we see this chain, we see this thing that happens around 250 acres. Jim feels like that's where the processing problems really start to happen. So Jim Kroom, he says, after about a thousand frames, you really start to see issues occurring. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go head to head our current camera system versus the DJI L1 to really show what's going on when you go drone, cam, manned air flight, versus drone and we'll just we'll just run this this scenario right here so i, I wanted to get close so since you guys are in vegas or trent <laughs> is you have the main airport in the middle of vegas the red line is the five mile ring so anything inside of that five mile ring you cannot fly without a waiver so maybe you'll get granted in, in 30 days and maybe maybe the FAA will not grant you this permission. So I took a right to the north of the, onto the strip, which is right to the north of the airport. Uh, we're going to go right here. Okay. So this is just north of the airport. And what I've done is the little blue polygon, which you can see in the lower right next to the stadium is three acres. Then the lighter blue is 16, then I went 50, then 100, and then 250, and then 500. And then I really ramped it up to 2,050 acres so we can really see, you know, let's let's put it on a full scale against each other. As you can see, the sphere is there. It's very excited. The sphere wants everybody to come to it and see the new things. And, uh, and Vegas, Vegas is raging right now. 
So we're going to go back and then we're going to look at this spot right here. So as you can see, if we wanted any of this data that I just showed you, it's all in zeros. So that means it's not even possible to fly. So this is the airspace map of Las Vegas. You can see zeros, hundreds, lots of zeros to the northwest, a lot of, uh, lot of zeros into the northwest because that's an airport area. And then, it, then there's some two, three, 400. So the 400 is fine. And if 200 would be fine for most operations, but as you can see in the area we want to fly, you can't even fly the drone at all. So you, you would request it and maybe they would honor probably a hundred feet if that, if they would, if you would even be get access. So for all practical purposes, here we go. Three <laughs> acre site with the plane, one line, seven exposures, two mapping models, one minute online five GCPs with the UAV, three lines, 45 exposures, 45 mapping models, three, met, three to five minutes online. So we're, we're everything's fine right now, five GCPs. 16 acre, one line, 12 exposures, three stereo models, one minute online still, five GCPs. Drone, 12 lines, 190 exposures. So the, so the exposure count, we're starting to get up and we were only at 16, 16 acres, 160 models, seven minutes online, five GCPs. 50 acres, we're over top of New York, New York and the stadium where is that, that's where the, uh, the hockey team plays, correct? Right? Yep, you got it. Okay, so for 50 acres with the plane, two lines, 27 exposures, 12 mapping models, five to seven minutes online, five GCPs. With the UAV, 24 lines, 528 exposures, 482 mapping models, 15 to 20 minutes online. You would probably have to move, maybe you probably move twice. So it'd be a little bit for beyond visual line of sight, you would uh, be in one corner and then go to the next corner and then 15 to 20 minutes online. What the, this is just, just yeah. on a real, real quick, what, yeah. what would your flight height on those be? What do you, since you're at zero on a UAV, but. Well, uh, for the plane, we would be flying uh, four centimeter GSD. So it'd be yeah. um, about 1800 feet okay. for this one. So 18, uh, thank you for clarifying, uh, 1800 feet for that. That's like a four centimeter, that's standard 40 scale mapping. Uh, it's a really good pixel. It's not the best pixel. That would be 20 scale, 2.5 centimeter. And the drone would be producing 1.67 centimeter. So 100 acre site, three lines, 39 exposures, 18, model, 18 mapping models, 10 to 15 minutes online, 10 GCPs. Now we are really starting to get it. 23 lines, 874 exposures, 828 models, 20 to 30 minutes, and 20 GCPs, 250 acres. Now you're really starting to cover some ground in, inside of Vegas. <laughs> Four lines, 55 exposures, 36 stereo mapping models, 12 to 15 minutes online, 12 GCPs. The drone, 36 lines, 2,000 exposures, 1,938 mapping models, 35 to 50 minutes at this point, because you're going to have to have multiple setups across those. You're going to be, you know, one in the corner, one in the corner, up in the top, back in the top, maybe in the corner again, and 50 GCP. So right about that point, 12 GCPs, 30, 55 exposures versus 50 GCPs and 2,000 exposures. You're really... It's a, you're really starting to, it's starting to show itself right here. And then we jump to 500, seven lines, 124 exposures, 70 models, 20 to 30 minutes online, 18 GCPs. And with the drone, it's 57 lines, 6,498 exposures, 6,100 stereo models, 180 plus minutes online and 100 GCPs if you want the same exact accuracy as you're getting from the airplane, that's roughly each acre times 0.2 to get this the, the GCP count for the drone, which is a sweet spot generated by Jim Kroon and his math model. And lastly, last but not least, we go all the way out. <laughs> 
12 lines of photography, 331 exposures, 238 models, 30 to 40 minutes online. The airport is going to probably be pretty pissed off about this flight, I'm sure. Uh, 30 GCPs. And then when you look at the drone, so it's only, I mean, I've heard many people, we did 1,000 and 2,000 and 5,000 acres and all this stuff. So 90 lines, 19,800 exposures, 19,000. It would be, I I was coming to the crunch on this one. It's a little less, mm -hmm. about 19,000 models, five hours online, 400 GCPs. And then you would have to cut that into 19 pieces of a thousand each and then seam those all together to make the actual mosaic that's just before you even that's just to get the point cloud and the mosaic to you know to mesh so i mean it, i don't i don't think people really realize you know i think we talk about it a lot i think it's just really really important to just showcase this is the real math this is what it really looks like and this is how kind of painful it's going to be and then the funny part 25 years from now they're going to just turn a satellite onto one image and go it was going to take you how long <laughs> right it could be shorter than that <laughs> right yeah. exactly they're going to look back I at mean, this video and go what in the hell were these guys doing back then in 19 yeah but that could i mean that'll that will not only destroy aerial mapping but it will <laughs> also destroy the land surveying profession in general so you don't quite get away scot free the, the <laughs> land surveying doesn't get quite a scot free and then you know the fun part in my job is deciding what aerial platform will create the most accurate efficient and cost effective solution for, for the project so is it mobile LIDAR? Is it terrestrial LIDAR? Is it aerial LIDAR? Is it drone? Is it chain? Is it just going down with uh, um, level looping? I mean, how accurate does it need to be? Or is it need? Is it it's just for planning purposes? So there's all these variables and you really try to work with the clients to really understand, you know, what's really going on, what they really need and and really explain to them simply what's happening all right so this is we're going to talk this is a i'm going to finish up here with good. deliverables yep. from the uav i think we all understand what the the mapping deliverables from the manned aircraft the manned aircraft is in stereo mapping 2d 3d autocad point spots and breaks xml surface ortho photography and then if you get lidar you can get the raw lidar the bare earth lidar any classification and then full planimetric so it's a little different in the ua the uav world because we're going we're not seeing in stereo so i think that's important to to note as well so here we go uh-oh whoa <laughs> <laughs> okay that didn't turn out that just corrupted so i okay hope you wow. can read your writing what happened there okay so don't mind the uh funniness that somehow that transposed itself through a copy and paste so i'll just uh rough it here <laughs> you can so do what it. you're seeing here is the ortho photo full contouring one foot contouring and all the planimetrics over a large site that we did for the AGIC UAS fly-in um, about a month or two ago. This was a really cool event put on by the Arizona GIS Council, and we flew this site. And this is a presentation that Jim gave. So I'm I'm gonna I'm just gonna rework it. A lot of different sensors available. Which is the right one to use? What you make that choice. Jim has figured out for a lot of different, uh, as you can see from that website right there, www.cc4w.net, web app, cooper.html. If you plug in your UAV up in the top, it says drone name, give it the front side overlap necessary and the format that you're looking for, JPEG, TIFF, or RAW. It will spit out the forward overlap and the neat model specific and capture interval, all the stuff, and give you all the uh, the very important ephemeris data that you need, and give you the uh, GSD that you're going to uh, ground sample distance of the centimeter, P 
pixel that you're going to get, which is really cool. So when we're planning this, as you can see, uh, Jim set out his aerial targets. He's got his checkpoints in there so that we're checking our data. We're not just we're not just going out there blindly and setting panels and not knowing, you know, we don't have anything to check against. You want to look for all obstacles when you're out there. You want to pre-program everything um, that you want to get everything done in, in, in the office, go to the field, look for all your obstacles, make sure you've got your checklist set up, fly the job safely, get in and get out. Um, it's really important. The thing that's beautiful with the M300 or anything after the M300 is you can do all the uh, pre-planning on the fly. So if you don't like the plan, you don't like the plan that you currently have, you can do it on the controller. A lot of the controllers can do that now before they could not. So it's really uh, fast and usable now. Targets. We like to use the one foot by one foot circles. He says nine to 12, uh, one quadrant black, one quadrant white. Super important for the geolocation and applying that those coordinates to your map inside of the AT for the for the UAV processing software. We particularly like MetaShape Pro for all the pre-processing and then Civil 3D for everything afterwards. Now, okay, now we're back. Now we're back in the world. So <laughs> that is the uh I guess that's the I guess that's the new, I don't even know what that one's called, but you have a really, really good controller and flight ops. Uh, import your KML from Google Earth to the smart controller in the Waypoint mission, and then fly the mission when you get there. Is that the Mavic 3? Is that what that, that I think that is the Mavic, yeah, Mavic 2 or Mavic 3. Looks like the 3, yeah. This is what the software will create for you, the meta shape. You'll bring in all, at the top, you've got all your pictures. You're looking for your control points. You're identifying your control points in your DSM. The DSM is the, um, what is that? Not digital elevation. It's, it's, I call it raw because it's got all your 3D information. It's got your trees and your buildings and all the houses and everything that's available. Um, what, what's DSM stand? I, I'm blanking right now. Digital surface models. Thank you, buddy. I couldn't That's think like, of the surface. I, I didn't Digital think it was surface that simple. Model. I know. I'm. I'm trying to get. I'm. I'm like. I'm at the back end, and okay. <laughs> I knew what it stood for. Digital surface model, and then you're. Then you will eventually take that digital surface model and turn it into a DEM, digital elevation model, which is your bare earth. Thank you, Will Wing, by the way, and. There you have your DSM, then you have your point cloud, your colorized point cloud, which takes your LIDAR and um, takes your RGB values and turns it into the point cloud. Hooper does something a little bit different in our processing, which is drawing break lines on the bare earth surface. So Jim has taken his knowledge of 45 years and instructed the team on understanding how the grade breaks work when looking at a surface. Without this kind of innate understanding and un, you know getting it from the field kind of way, you wouldn't really understand how to do it. But the reason we do this is if you just clean a DSM to a DEM, which is a bare earth surf, a bare earth LIDAR, you're gonna get a lot of anomalous behavior. So the, the brake lines really bring things together You've got known elevations on the lines in combination with the DEM surface to create a much less squiggly mess of contours, which engineers and surveyors like a lot more than just kind of out of the out of the can or out of the process, really uh, light checking, if you will, um, for for this process. And that's why you have a really, really nice looking contour map right there. It's clean. It's not outrageous. There's not tons of spaghetti as they call it. Phil, Phil calls it the spaghetti lines. And then there's just your, there's your planimetrics. So you can see the little trail. You have all your tree line, tree denominations. 
and then you have all your you have your your break your spot points of the map in the background and then you have your contours and then you have your ortho and then our our standard deliverable is a 3d surface a 3d surface 2010 the ortho and then the 2d topo 2d plan if you would like 3d plan you just take the surface and apply it to the 2d plan and just to look at some resolution you can see this is from the m300 the resolution is really good at 200 feet i mean you can see the storm grates you can see really really great you know uh, the roughness of the rocks and the detail in the rocks and see what's going on baseball diamond pools look beautiful the walls one of the kind of little flaws of uavs is really straight edges because there's a lot of distortion in the lenses different than manned aircraft or medium format you know 80 or 90 millimeter glass lenses um wide lenses really don't create create a fine edge and then you're also only taking in the neat model about 90 feet wide by 60 feet long so it's not a large amount of information being taken but you have to seam all that information together to get the output, which doesn't create a perfect edge. Um, I, I know in the future that will be remedied. Uh, the algorithm will fix that eventually. And then just, to, just so you can see the LIDAR on its side, uh, colorized LIDAR of the actual place with the houses. And you can see that uh, right up front, you can see the three dimensionality of that culvert right there. It looks beautiful. And then that's just another view of it. And I believe, yeah, all of our maps are deal, deal with uh, the ASPRS positional data, accuracy data standards. Um, everything that we do is based in land surveying methodology and the ASPRS positional accuracy standards for all of our maps. And they're all certified 20, 30, 40, 100 scale. And just to kind of close everything out, the brief timeline on the mapping standards, the mapping standards started in 1947, 1990, they did, they understood all the film information, but digital finally started class one, class two, class three. 2004, we made another leap. We established the bridge between federal and non-federal project standards. There wasn't one before 2014 full digital horizontal and vertical standards. And now currently we've got a new revision of the full digital standards for all photogrammetry. And then there is a, a brand new subset edition of all the UAV standards. And then there's also um, checkpoint and aerial target standards currently that, have, that are like, they're about to be finalized with how many checkpoints do you need per acreage? How many aerial mapping targets per acreage? Because they, what they found out is the data that they were putting out, like the numbers were extreme. Like you had to set 250 panels for blah, you know, this amount of acreage. The industry was not going to support that because the cost and the time to do that were outrageous. So they had to bring it back and put it what was realistic to um, the common surveyor and what would be realistic in the field, which wouldn't corrupt budgets. Just a quick brief, horizontal, vertical, 20 scale, half foot contours, 40, 100, one foot, two foot, four foot, five foot. And that's it. <laughs> we covered a lot. I, 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 do you have a, do you have a question? George? I love it. I love, yeah, George has got a question. Go for it, George. No, I have, I don't have a question. I have a couple of comments. First of all, a great presentation. I learned a lot. There, okay, thank you very much. Thank going you. Going on in this profession, it's, it's amazingly difficult to keep up with. I will tell you a quick story about my early career that will probably give you a good chuckle. Back in probably 1970, I believe it was, I was sent out as part of a survey crew to put photo panels on a project in a valley on the eastern side of the Sierra. And at that time, the typical photo panel was a one foot wide strip of tar paper, eight feet long. You made a 
a cross out of it. So you had four foot legs and one foot wide. Uh, so we were sent out to this valley to panel this project. We've done the control already. We went out there and laid down the panels, uh, black tar paper on six inches of snow. I never saw the map from that, but I'm suspecting it never really happened. <laughs> Somehow, I don't know. Can you get contour information? You can't focus on different elevations of snow as far as I can tell. No, I, yeah, snow is, snow is, that's a brutal situation and, and be able to, you know, it's your good, there's going to be like little undulations and the white, you know, the contrast of the white is going to, those targets are going to be fantastic though. I know they're yeah. going to have great values on those targets, but everything else will be some but guess. We knew where those targets were. We had that information. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they probably of... just did their best on the, the top of the surface of that snow. I'm sure that's about as good as they could get, I would imagine. I, I don't I don't think they ended up mapping it. I, I think oh, okay. the, the photogrammist looked at that and said, hey, this isn't happening. This, we what gotta wait for spring. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's awesome. Jesse, go for it. Oh, for the snow comment really quick, uh, just throw a can of spray paint with an M80 out there. It'll uh, map it perfectly. Right. <laughs> um, but real question for you. Yes, how much are you guys, uh, or how many missions have you ran the new L2 on uh, to run proofs? And what have you compared that data to uh, other equipment that you guys have in-house? Currently, we don't have the L2. We have the L1 uh, L, we have the L1 system with the M300. Jim did work with DJI to do the some initial testings, and I th I think probably the best white paper, if you want to look up some really good information, is a uh, Bam Bam Tech uh, Christian Stallings wrote like a 30 page white paper on that. So. If you want some really up to date information on the white paper on that, that's what I would. That's the resource that I would look at. So Christian Stallings Bam Tech L two white paper. If you Google that, it will come up, and you can download the white. I think you have to email them. Uh, you have to email them, and then they'll send you that, and they also send you the availability of like ten different point clouds to look at yourself. Okay. That's and I've read I've read the beginning of it. It looks really good. Uh, the information's a lot clearer, and somehow they made it cheaper. I don't know how. I'm sure that's aggravating some uh, you know other uh, other manufacturers in the industry. People were not they were not they were happy with the L1, but a lot of people complained about it. But you have to know how to constrain the data and get the best information that you can get out of it. And we have to remember, you know, 20 years ago, 15 by 15, uh, you know, Jim would always say, well, you could get 10 by 10 grid and that was good enough. And we had really great information. Now we have millions of points inside of that 10 by 10 grid. So uh, I don't know really what the, uh, what the issue is. Yeah, I'm just looking for some more information because I'm looking for an additional solution for some smaller projects. And with the newest release of the L2, it's adding something in to look at because the other one I'm looking at is the, uh, what is it? The Aerial BLK 360 system. The Aerial BLK, that's that's another, another good one. I mean, I would just compare... <laughs> You know, try to compare apples to apples and um, uh, what would you, you'd be looking for, what would that be? How many points per, how many points per second is it, you know, is it two, 250,000, is it 500,000, is it a million? And then that's going to determine the, ex, you know, how expensive, it, how expensive it really is, you know, the, the number of return and then the number of returns that you're getting. And then accuracy of you know targeting and and data that you're getting out of the cloud basically yeah because i need uh small solutions for bridge work and i think that something of that nature might Absolutely. be yeah. a good solution and anything from the regal line would be overkill it's yeah In a lot of cases. yeah if you don't have that many projects yeah if you add a ton a ton of projects the regal's well, going to, the regal's going and another, to another thing that i I'm, I'm looking at is you know, putting it on smaller platforms too. 
Okay. Mm -hmm. You know, to get underneath ridge structures. You know, so like one of the ones that uh, we have up here in Portland, we're doing is the I-205 Abernathy Bridge Project, where we're doing an existing uh, four-lane highway bridge replacement of 10 sections. It's a 10-section bridge that we're replacing in place. And so finding, and we're, we're doing a lot of scanning and we keep having to send crews up on man lifts from barges. And I'm trying to find a solution to not have to do that. Okay. Have you looked at the Emerson hover map solution as well? That's a really good one. The reason why that one's good because you can front it, you can mount it on the front so that the laser will, you know, to get the, the, the north looking, everything else is mounted below basically a lot of times. So that one. Well, that and one that's why I was thinking like the L2 because it was able to rotate off the gimbal. But what's okay. that last one you said? One's called the uh, Emerson hover map. It's a really cool platform. That one was pretty noisy when it first came was out. Was it noisy? Sure. It's a it's a geo slam type exactly. of product. Yeah. So but they they've been working on that one. Like right. That's what I was wondering. The thing that's cool about that is you can fly that one remotely from California in Africa and it works. It's really crazy. <laughs> so the, you know, they're little niche on you know different types of things to figure out. There's a lot to figure out. Uh Jesse, where are you located? Up in Portland. Uh, I'm actually in Wilsonville, which is just south of Portland. Okay, cool, cool. And then we have offices up in the Puget Sound area as well. Um uh, and technically our uh parent company, which is Atlas, is located all over the country. Uh, we have over 100 offices now. Wow. Uh, but for the surveying practices, we uh, control the Pacific Northwest and we're looking at opening up a Boise shop here, hopefully in the first to second quarter of next year. Okay. And what was what was your company called? I mean, you said Atlas. Oh, uh, One Alliance Geomatics. We are uh, a service specific firm. Mm -hmm. We have 80 individuals we operate with over 34 crews and 20 licensees along the west coast and powerhouse powerhouse <laughs> that's awesome somebody's right, got to a trend uh, david, <laughs> david david kendall asked uh, we'll go down through the the yeah. chat real quick uh david kendall thank you jesse amazing i would look up those look up those platforms david kendall asked do you ever work in mexico uh, we have a sales office and a stereo compiler there. Working in Mexico, we've done it. Uh, Cooper Aero got a plane stolen in 1994 once. That was probably kind of closing out the door. It's hard to work in Mexico. It's not impossible. There is a lot of mine act, you know, really great. Uh, the There's a mine collective, the... Sonoida Mine Collective, which has 90 mines, but there's, it's a very long process to get involved. And then uh, probably, I, I don't think the flying part is as hard. It's the land surveying part that would be the harder part and the, commu the clear communication, getting on site. And then ever since COVID, um, things have slowed down in Mexico quite a bit. It's it's better now, obviously, but it, it's slowed and they may have changed processes. And then maybe the doors that might have had a little bit of squeak in them, they may have closed as well. So working in Mexico is tough and I would love to work there more, but it's not, it's not that as easy as I'd like it to be. <laughs> uh, Mike Detweiler spent a lot of time mapping in Part Navia and the 337, amazing. Mm -hmm. um, Will Wing says, what do I think about uh, near map and satellite imagery subscription? I know Trent uses it. He's calling you out, Trent. And right. uh, what is the, uh, what is the, what is the GSD? Is it, can you map from it? I mean, you can map from any 2D, uh, obviously you could draw things, but is it seven centimeter? Is it 15 centimeter? What is it? Yeah, I was just trying to look up. So the near map is what we use. Um, and when we first got into it a few years ago, it was a lot more cost effective. But 
they've it's changed gone. the price the price yeah changed. yeah 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 drastically to the to the tune of like double um but i, w- I was trying to look up the thing but i i feel like it's um uh, somewhere in that five to seven uh okay imagery so, i mean you can zoom in super five, tight now. you know it's five it's pushing it's pushing the boundaries of one foot so yeah it'd be like a 50 scale and then if you had a seven centimeter or a 10 centimeter at 100 or 200 scale two foots if you want to if you want to stop sharing i can i can share mine really quick okay I'll share, cool i'll share uh zoom in on one of the i just went to phoenix just obviously i know between you and will and all that being down there this was i was trying to go to somebody's park but i mean that's that's imagery from may of may 27 to 23 so the way near map works is anything over 50,000 in population they fly every quarter and then if it's over that then they fly I think like twice a year but um you could in reality yeah you could definitely map off this if you wanted it's to starting but... to get pretty beat up right there I mean that yeah was just... yeah the, the corners the, the canopy clean. looks pretty good but then that yeah. edge looks pretty tough yeah, here's here's another. One. I mean, we were using a lot of this because uh, you can you can pull down geo reference. So we were doing tracing bad. a lot of park and stripes and that kind of stuff. So um, when we first started uh, doing it, and it was more so before we started drawing and drawing on a lot of them. But I mean, it's it's great for that if you're just going to start tracing park and stripes, so you didn't have to shoot all that stuff. But well, I can see it being beneficial in Vegas and areas where you can't get flying access to. Right. Um, but I guess my question is, you know, that you don't have any targets, you don't have any control to that. Right. How do you, I mean, are you just picking PIDs of the park and stripes and kind of, exactly. you still having to manipulate the images to your points? A little bit. Yeah. You're still okay. kind of, you're still moving things around like you would traditional, you know, some of the stuff, okay. the old days of uh, aligning and, and moving, but um we've been using it a lot of times, even just QAQC sometimes on the field crews too, right? Like, I mean, you, they forgot something you're able to they've got uh you can go in and even grab obliques out of it um as it uh, crashes but i mean you can kind of just zoom around and so you can it, it's good but it's i think it's up to i think we're paying 6500 a year now for it i mean it's super expensive wow. now it used to when we first got into it i think it was like 3900 or something like that for the year and now it's now it's jumped quite a bit so it wow. But it's, I mean, it's, if it saves you, uh, it saves you a couple of crews going back and forth to the, going back to grab a, grab something, sometimes it'll save you, but so, yeah, but it's, it's clean. It's just not, it's just kind of expensive. I mean, it's, <laughs> so it's great for recons, of course, too, but that kind of stuff. So just another, another good tool to have. Yeah, it, it truly is. It's what it is and they do have i mean you can see like you know they're starting to put all the pls and i mean they're running with the gis stuff so you can start to start to kind of tie pieces together but that's a nice house is that your house trent yeah no this is down of scottsdale i just zoomed over to scottsdale it's but pretty sweet you're right yeah that's cool that's a night that whoever's house that was that's yeah that was fun so yeah no i i think it is I think it's worth it uh, from a cost saving standpoint and just kind of recon and, and uh, you know, with multiple, multiple field crews that you can use it as QAQC. So I haven't used the other one though. You said the satellite. So I haven't, I haven't seen that one, but near maps is what we've been using probably close to four or five years now. So. Right on. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, just looking at the chat, George, thank you again for the kind words. Uh, Cindy, thank you. Uh, Steve Martin, what effect will the new Sony global shutter have when applied to a U- UAV mapping flight? I mean, that would be a good question. Uh, Will, do you have any thought on that? Jim Kroom is the global shutter guy. That is the global shutter it's always firing or is that correct steve you could chime in on this like could you give me your two cents i know the difference but uh well from what i know you know uh, as opposed to a rolling shutter where you get right right near you know it exposes the whole the center whole at one time right? at once yeah 
that's that's going to be your best bet obviously the the rolling is like building that's what gives you the the weird line you know the weird line arrays because it's building pixel by you know row by row by row by row right correct yeah yeah so yeah global i think that's what uh I think that's what every everybody's using currently. I mean, that would be the that's the preferred, I would imagine. Well, it's brand new, so I, I don't think there's any mapping solutions out with it yet. Is the are the are the A sevens or A nine like the Sony A seven or A nine or A nines? The A nines are. I, I, I don't think yeah. the A seven. The A sevens are not though. Okay. A9. Okay. Okay. Yeah. There's. There's quite a few on the market that have global shutters. Global shutters, right? Yeah, they're, they're fantastic. I mean, they're 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 really good. And what about is now? What about uh, is that different? I'm just throwing this out there. Is that different than mirrorless, Michael or Steve? Like mirrorless that's, doesn't have the mirror anymore, and that's not your shutter. That's just reflecting the imagery back onto. So okay, right. That's, that's yeah. That's a different mechanism. Yeah. That's for the SLR. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we've gotten rid of that. We've gotten it smaller. Okay. Um, Steve, do you have any other questions, sir? Uh, no, that's it for now. Okay. Uh, Troy Alderson, thank you for the kind words. Jesse, thank you. Anybody else have any? Uh, I, I just want to thank everybody for being here. Trent, you're, uh, you know, oh, you're, fun. A you're a treasure to the community, man. <laughs> thank you. Absolutely. I mean, we we appreciate what you do for us and no, uh, no worries. Thirty people were thirty plus people were out tonight. I man, it couldn't be. It was happier. good. Yeah, no, I love the I love the history. I, it's funny how we kind of talked about the whole Steve Parrish history and all his books, and then your whole presentation presentation started going all the way back. And so I thought that was that was a cool little tie in. But I loved uh, I love going back. Nice to know, you know you got yeah. a, a little pepper there. You know I could. I that, love it the hours of material on that one but yeah just yeah no that was pretty fun. important it's pretty it important. Fun. i think it you know it just it's amazing how much things changing and of course like you talked about the uavs and and just even the next five years progression of that what it's going to look like and you know just the ai side of the software and you know all the all of that what's gonna we're gonna look back at this you know five years from now and go holy shit that looked like it was from 1950s you know I think it's going to be, I think it'll be interesting. So maybe the, uh, the next photogrammetry will be the AI photogrammetry. Mm -hmm. I guess. Prob I mean, where do you go past digital then? Like, what do you, yeah. I mean, how do you, what do you do that? That has to go into something next. So maybe that will be the next version of it. Interesting. I know. Anybody got uh, more specific questions? That was awesome. Mike, you want anything to add to that? Uh, maybe uh, we could, I guess we could hit on the remote ID stuff because it is only because both of you guys have kind of been up on it, but yeah, you know, they updated did the software updates for if your system, if your bird uses it, you should be using it today. So. Yeah. Yeah. I just, I just finally found out where in our wing show where that actually lived. And I actually saw the setting like remote ID is, is active and running. So that was the first time I saw that last week. And then we have another big heavy lifter and we actually, we just got the, um, the third party module, you know, it, that just came in. So now I got to get that thing installed and, um, on the, uh, big heavy lift, uh, multi, uh, multi rotor, um, drone that we have. So which, yeah, that's which third party. Did you, which one did you buy? Oh, you know, I think drone tags, the, the most, uh, okay. Okay. popular one, but that's not the yeah. one we got. We got one that was, um, it was Rick, the, the, the aircraft we have is a Watts innovation, um, prism sky. We we asked Watts. I, I forget who it was. One of my cohort, Jason, purchased it. But um, Watts. He um, Bobby Watts recommended something different from another manufacturer. So that's the one we got. But it, it's the same size. You know, it's only a few inches by a few inches. It's pretty small. Okay. Very cool. But no, I I, I mean just a just a. I, I don't have anything really to add. I I just yeah. I appreciate your presentation, Zach. I mean that's it's like if I was gonna. If I was going to do a presentation, I'd do, you know, very similar to what you said. I, I think, I think those slides that you had, um, comparing different sizes, you know, with, you know, five acres, 10 acres, 20, whatever with the, with a manned aircraft versus a drone. I think that's, I think that's really valuable stuff. Um, it was very much in my experience. I might, I would, 
everybody's we all got our own experiences right and what 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 works for us i, I would probably go we, we've flown bigger stuff with drones but um I, I think more to the point though is like your business or your experience is going to dictate where you find the sweet spot and all that mm-hmm. and um i think that's really important stuff as professionals we need to know that and not listen to what the manufacturers tell us can be done you know yeah, but- Nice. They're always, you know, they have their agenda and, and their agenda is fine as well. But yeah, you have to, you have to see through it and you have to see through it. You have to test it. And then will it work for you and your business? And and will it provide the the deliverables and the solution that your clients are, you know, wanting basically? I think. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the helicopters and the airplanes, they worked for a long time. They still work. Right. And yeah, uh, yeah we just added drones to it and they've got their spot. And I would say, you know, to piggyback on Mike's comments, I think is a lot, it goes back to just, you know, survey profession in general, not practicing outside your expertise, right? And I think sometimes when you're getting into this drone game too, as well, you think, you know, you can just fire up a Mavic and fly it really quick and come back and map. I think before you start delivering to clients, you better, you know, start ground checking everything and all that kind of stuff. Because I've heard, seen and heard horror stories of, delivering surfaces off you know a half a foot or being totally warped or skewed or any of that kind of stuff right and so uh if if you're just solely relying on yourself when it comes to a uav you definitely better start ground proofing the heck out of it so that uh you're really solid with it before you start delivering it and so i know we've i mean that's what we practiced for many years before i even me personally felt comfortable with delivering it you know i mean yeah. guys just keep shooting if you're gonna you're gonna fly it with a drone and then you're going to do your processes and you're going to do everything, but you should have shot it, you know, like you would traditionally deliver it to an engineer with uh, 1500 ground points and then check your data, right? Like it's, it, there's, you got to be definitely uh, making sure you, making sure you check the stuff before you send it out. Cause so, right. yeah, exactly. So I know it's, that's, it's, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, that's the best part about being a surveyor is that yeah. we have the power to check it. You exactly. know that most of the guys mm-hmm. flying in the air have no idea. So exactly. yeah. good power yeah. to good power to have. Yeah. Great point. Yeah. Well, power in this, in this <laughs> <for sure. laughs> I love it. Anybody else want to add? Got anything else to add to it? I love it. That was great. I love the the whole thing. That was great, Zach. Going backwards to, to bringing it forward. So thanks for having me, Trent. Yeah, no, of course. Thanks. Great to great to see everybody. And uh, I was very happy to be here today. Thank you so much. Awesome, guys. All right. Well. Nobody got anything else. Have a good week, everybody. See you guys. Bye. Bye, guys.